hopefully that will work. We shall see. So we talked about Leo Frank yesterday. Um, Governor Slayton, who is actually Governor John Slayton, commutes his sentence. He changes it from um, the death penalty to life in prison. It's good news for Leo Frank, right? No, it's not. Um, his death at the hands of the state of Georgia might have been a little more humane. I, I'm not sure. September 16, 1916, um, a group of men, there were about 25 or so, a group of armed men called the Knights of Mary Fagan, break into the prison in Milledgeville here. Remember the brick from yesterday? Did I talk to you about that? Showed you this brick before. It's got a fingerprint on it. It's cool brick, handmade. Um, I stole it. No, I I borrowed it. Is that better? Never never took it back. I trespassed and I picked this brick out of a pile um, from after they have torn down the old state prison. Um, but anyway, they break into the prison. They grab Leo Frank. They know exactly where he is. Um, he's actually in the hospital um, or the infirmary um, of the prison because somebody tried to slit his throat. Prisoner didn't take too kindly that he had killed Mary Fagan and tried to kill him. Slit his throat. He's in the hospital. Um, those who come to get Leo Frank again know exactly where he is. Um, two or three years ago, University of North Georgia student was doing her student teaching in Atlanta, went into a, either an antique store or a yard sale or something and found a, a handful of keys on a key ring. It had a little brass disc on it. The little brass disc had the name of the warden from the Milledgeville prison at the time that Leo Frank was um, was taken. The warden's excuse was um, he couldn't find his keys. He must have lost them. Now, put two and two together. They knew exactly where Leo Frank was, and they easily accessed the prison. And the warden had lost his keys. It's magic. It was gnomes. Had to be. Obviously, the warden was part of this conspiracy. Um, not long after the Knights of Mary Fagan abduct Leo Frank on top of Stone Mountain, a huge cross was doused with kerosene and ignited, and the Ku Klux Klan is reborn in Georgia um, shortly after Leo Frank's murder. And think about Stone Mountain back in 1916. There's no carving on it. Um, there's not a lot of light pollution. Light pollution is a thing. And so that cross would have been seen literally for miles and miles and miles. Um, and so the Klan comes back with a vengeance and, of course, um, you know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, they are hard at work trying to deny folks their civil rights. All right, we're going to take just a few minutes this morning and end our talk about lynching um, by looking at something that actually um, Dr. Deaton suggested um, and actually uh, has him in it. Um, he does a vlog, a video blog called Off the Deaton Path. Um, some of y'all might know that because of his greatest fan. Um, but uh, let, me just, let me just warn you, okay? It's pretty graphic. Um, you're going to see some pictures that are very disturbing. Um, and, and that's saying something. I mean, it'll be the most disturbing picture you have seen in this class. And that's saying something. I mean, you know, you saw the guy that, you know, what I, the, you know, I found out that um, that that photograph, um, his 
the state of his body might not have been because of uh, wounds received in battle, but feral pigs, feral pigs may have done that because they would often, yeah, well, they do. They smell blood and that's it. Yeah, so may or may not be. But again, um, you know, if you if you don't want to see this, if you're not comfortable seeing this, then cover your eyes. There you go. All right. So Emmett Till is a 14-year-old little boy. We'll get to him in a minute. Did I not show you all that? Dang. Okay. Leo Frank, Mary Fagan. Nah. Millersville State Prison. Um, again, brick from the prison. Um, and again, this is where Leo Frank is, and it's kind of interesting. One of the things that I like historical uh, or why I like historical objects and a brick can be a historical object is you don't know what this brick saw. You don't know what this brick heard. It could have been in one of these walls. It could have been in one of these columns right here where Leo Frank was when those men came and got him out of the prison. You, you just don't know. And, of course, a brick can't talk and a brick can't tell you what it saw. or you know. But you know, it's just the... The history that it witnessed um, is pretty cool. All right. Um, Bob takes Frank from jail. And here's the funniest thing, the only funny thing you'll hear in here today. Prisoner rushed from State Farm in an automobile. Jake was driving. That's it. That's all I can give you today. Um, but again, it, front page news. Does anybody really care? No, they don't. Um, this is the picture that you always see of Leo Frank and his body. You can tell it, it was pretty nasty. It was pretty gnarly. Um, and then, um, Caden, this was found in your grandmama's house? Great grandmama's house. Okay, so which one of these is your? Uh huh. Yeah. That would be my great great granddad. Okay. That's the man that took that picture. This back here. This is your great great grandfather. Okay. I don't know if y'all can see that. There's a man here, a man here, and then there's a man right here, and that's that's not that long removed, um, and. And like uh, like all of us, I, I mean, there, there are things when we go back and we look at our history, our family history, you're going to find something that makes you uncomfortable, always. Um, for example, my I know my granddaddy was a moonshiner because he had a cat that had one blue eye and one green eye, and that cat would sit on the front porch and drink moonshine with my granddaddy. Another bad cat. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, that, and this was a postcard, by the way. That's the really weird thing. Not that we have this picture, but that it was a postcard. Could you imagine getting that in the mail? Yeah. Merry Christmas. I said something yesterday, and I'm not going to say it again. Because, yeah, I did not say that, but it might have been heard coming from my mouth. I don't. Anyway, um, so like thousands, at least a thousand people came by to view Leo Frank's remains. He's cut down. His body's not desecrated, um, and he's actually sent back to New York, where he's buried. I think in Brooklyn, in the family cemetery. Um, and this enraged the world. 1986, however, a young man by the name, well, he wasn't such a young man then, um, but in 1913, a young man named Alonzo Mann saw John Conley 
carrying Mary Fagan's body down to the basement. And Alonzo Mann reports 71 years after Leo Frank's death that it was indeed John Conley that killed Mary Fagan because John Conley told Alonzo Mann, boy, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you, I'll kill your mama, I'll kill your daddy. I mean, you're 10, 11, 12 years old. That's a heavy threat. Um, Alonzo Mann actually does tell his parents what John Conley had, well, what he had seen and what John Conley told him. His parents tell him to keep his mouth shut. And Alonzo Mann actually is a part of the trial. And what does he do? He keeps his mouth shut. I mean, there's John Conley sitting in the in the courtroom with him, and he doesn't say a word about his involvement. Um, the the state of Georgia does not reverse. That's a, a misstatement. They don't exactly reverse the guilty verdict, um, but they do in 18, 1986 recognize that. Um, Leo Frank uh, probably did not kill Mary Fagan, but they do not vacate that conviction. They do not. They may have done that since. There was some stuff that happened in the 2000s, and I'll go back and look for it, look at it. But what, what we do know is that Jim Conley, did I say John Conley? I think I did. Jim Conley um, is more than likely the person that killed Mary Fagan, according to Jim. You know, back in 1913, they didn't do rape analysis and that kind of thing, so we, we don't know. I would imagine there was some kind of sexual impropriety. How's that for dancing around the issue? Um, she may have been raped. And Jim Conley may have been the one that did it. I mean, she was a pretty girl. But that doesn't give anybody the right to rape somebody just because they're pretty. I mean, you know, look at me. Shut up, London. All right. Um, he, Mary Turner. She is brutally lynched. Her baby is cut from her body. And stomped on. Was that in the newspaper the next day? I mean, did people in London report about Mary Turner? Did people in Chicago write about Mary Turner in New York City? No, they didn't. But this guy, they write about. And people around the world are enraged at what happened to Leo Frank. Why? It's a real simple answer. Because he's white. And what else about Leo Frank? He's Jewish. And so the world is enraged at the lynching of a white Jewish male in Georgia. There were over 600 lynchings in Georgia, and they don't get that kind of coverage. What we're going to see next, and, and oh, well, I need to read something to you before then. I don't think I shared this with you yesterday. Um, but again, the, the world is outraged about what happens to Leo Frank. And in the Union Recorder, hey, there it is, Union Recorder, Union Recorder, right there. Um, during this time, Charles Moore, who's the editor, writes a column. And it begins, I'm going to read, uh, there are four paragraphs I'm going to share with you. In an editorial under the caption, Leo M. Frank, the Chicago, Daily, excuse me, the Chicago Daily Tribune says, The South is half-educated. It is a region of illiteracy, blatant self-righteousness, cruelty, and violence. Until it is improved by the invasion of better blood and better ideas, it will remain in reproach and a danger to the American Republic. That's from the Chicago Tribune. Charles Moore responds, such abusive and inflammatory editorials as have appeared in the northern and eastern papers in reference to the people of Georgia since Leo M. Frank was lynched 
do not tend in any measure to assist in the apprehension of the lynchers nor encourages nor encourage the officials of the state to use any undue diligence in looking up and bringing to justice the 25 men who are said to have engaged in the enterprise. And if you don't listen to anything else, listen to this. The real truth about the matter is that all, about 90% of the white people of Georgia believed Frank guilty and believed that under the operation of the law, his life was justly, legally, and righteously forfeited. So Charles Moore says what? He deserved what he got. He had it coming. And I think it's interesting he says about 90%. Did he do a poll? Did he ask white Georgians, what do you think about Leo Frank? No, he didn't. He's making it up as he goes along. Um, but there were many people in Georgia who thought that Leo Frank was guilty and deserved what he had coming to him. All right. Are you ready? I know I ask that a lot, but um, this photograph is incredibly disturbing. Uh, I just can't I can't say it um, any more than that. So having said that, let's go ahead. And those of you who are having to watch this on video, if you want to watch um, Dr. Deaton's um, Off the Deaton Path, that link is up at the top. Yep, um, and you can uh, you can go find that and watch it. I just can't the way I do things. I can't show you video in my video. Um, so Emmett Till's 14 years old. He's from Chicago, Illinois. He visits his cousins in Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta. Money, Mississippi. Um, he has been told, um, you know, don't do anything to draw attention to yourself. Don't um, cause people to notice you. Don't cause white people to notice you. And his mama said, you're going to hear Stan say this, if, if it takes you getting down on your knees in front of a white person to keep you from getting in trouble, you do it. Um, Emmett Till had been to Mississippi, I think, four other times, or this was his fourth visit, perhaps, and it, it doesn't end well, as you can, can see. Um, that's Emmett Till in life, and of course, this is Emmett Till in death. So, uh, let me shut up, and let's let Stan tell us about it. Here we go.
Thank you, young Jack. Well, let's uh, get rid of Stan. I know that hurts some of y'all's heart, but you need to get rid of Stan. All right. So here's my problem today. Uh, I mean, Emmett Till is, I mean, that's disturbing. That entire story is disturbing, but... You know, it's not unusual. And Stan mentioned um, that after those two men were found innocent or not guilty, that uh, they couldn't be tried again. That's double jeopardy. But there was also no civil rights violation. That law didn't exist yet. Um, there's a movie entitled Mississippi Burning. I think I've mentioned it before. Um, does it have to do with Emmett Till? It has to do with um, three young men from Chicago who come to Mississippi to register voters, and they are that brutally murdered. Their bodies are buried in a, an earthen dam, and they're eventually recovered. Um, the men are tried, and they're found innocent, but then they are later retried for violating the civil rights um, of those three gentlemen, and they're convicted not of murder, but of convicting, of convicting um, or of uh, violating the civil rights of those three, and that couldn't happen with Emmett Till. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So here's my problem today. How do I go from this to talking about Georgia politics in the early 20th century? How do we go from talking about murder, not necessarily in Georgia, but Leo Frank took place in Georgia? How do we go from that to talking about politics? I think it's a pretty seamless transition. 
because the 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 grisly nature of what we've talked about the past couple of days is in part because of the political nature, the political um, environment that you find in Georgia in the early part of the 20th century. So we're just going to jump right in. All right. Has to do with farmers. 1917. Remember, there's a lot of um, tension between farmers and industry. The Bourbon Triumvirate, you know, introduces business and industry to Georgia, and so farmers are kind of left out in the cold, and so there's a struggle. Well. In 1917, the Neal Primary Act is passed in Georgia, and what it does is it ushers in what is called the county unit system. Now, this can get a little confusing, so follow along with me. Under the county unit system, each county um, was given two unit votes in statewide elections. Okay, you with me so far? Per members of the House of Assembly. The House. Georgia's House. Okay? So if you had one representative in the House of Assembly, how many county unit votes did you get? Two. If you had three, then you got... Okay. And no county had more than three representatives. So no county in Georgia had more than six county unit votes. Got it? You with me? Not confused yet? Okay. So what does this mean? Well, Fulton County, we'll use that as an example. It is the most populated county in Georgia then and now, and it only got six unit votes. Six votes. Baldwin County, which was probably, I don't know. They might have had two representatives. I doubt it. Probably had one. They got how many votes? I got one. Thank you. I got one. Thank you. Um, so what this means is that these small rural counties where the farmers live, have actually more political clout than people who live in Fulton County, in these big counties. And that's by design. The design, the, the, the idea behind this is to give smaller counties more power in state government. That accomplishes two things. It kills the Republican Party in Georgia. I mean, it absolutely kills the Republican Party in Georgia, and it strips black voters voting power away. You, you can't. Where, where do most black people in Georgia live? Where are they starting to live? More urbanized. They've left the farm. They're, they're living in urban areas. And so what happens is a person can win a statewide election without having the majority of the popular vote. Got it? Okay, there's a test afterwards. Sometime. Don't know when yet. But sometime. All right. Let, let me see if I can drive the point home here. It's a little bit, except there's some, some guidelines, there's some safeguards in the Electoral College. Yeah, you can. It's happened, yeah. It's happened more frequently than people realize. But, yeah. Um, so he, here's what we got. Remember, this is 1920. So three years after the county unit system is installed. These are the eight most populous counties in Georgia in 1920. Fulton, which is Atlanta, Chatham, which is Savannah, Bibb County, which is Macon, Richmond County, which is Augusta, Muskogee, which is Columbus, DeKalb County would be Decatur. Basically, it's part of Atlanta today. Floyd County would be Rome, I believe. 
and then Lawrence County would be <clears throat> Dublin. Each of these counties has three representatives, which means they have how many county unit votes? How many votes is that? Eight times six is 48. Got it? All right. The next 30 counties had four county unit votes, which means they have two members of the House. So they get four votes. Two times two is four. There's 30 counties in that category. So how many votes do they have? 120. 120 plus 48 is 168. There are 159 counties in Georgia, then and now. 121 of those counties had two county unit votes, which meant what? They had one representative in the House of Assembly. So how many votes do those 121 counties have? 242. Who's winning? Small counties. Who lives in small counties? And we're talking population-wise. Huh? Yeah. Well, who would have lived in Hancock in 1920? What kind of thing was going on in Hancock? What did people do for a living? They farmed, right? They farmed. And so in these small rural counties, and we're talking small population-wise, not necessarily area, but population-wise, where fewer people live, they actually have more political power. And, and this is... I think a striking statement. The 38 largest counties, these eight plus 30 more, had two thirds of Georgia's voters. Two thirds. That's a huge majority. The other 121 counties together could decide an election. So, what happens? Well, let's look and see what happens. Let me show you how that works again. Um, you can see how votes in the county unit system were distributed. 59% um, of the vote belonged to rural communities, rural counties. Over half. That's all you need. You only need 51%. So here's what could happen. You have Fulton County, and this is these are today's numbers. Well, a couple of years ago, last year, I think. 556,326, that's in Fulton County. Now, there's many more people that live in Atlanta, but Atlanta's really taken over several different counties. But 556,326, if the county unit system were in, intact today, Fulton County would receive three county unit votes. That's all for half a million people. Eccles County has 1,876 people living in it. They came up here and played basketball one year. Thank you. I got one, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Eccles County, a couple of years ago, and, and well, actually been the latest census, so that would have been 2010, had a population of 1,876. How many county unit votes would they get? Glasscock County. Everybody knows Glasscock County. A little over 2,600 people. How many votes? One. How many we got now? Two. And then Quitman County, a little over 2,400. How many votes? How many do they get? Three. So you have a population of 6,980 with the same voting power as a half a million people. Is that fair? No. But that was Georgia's political system for almost 50 years, 45 years. Um, and it just wasn't fair. It did not create a political environment where my vote and your vote counted the same. So what happens? Gray versus Sanders, Supreme Court case. And it actually declares the unit county system is unconstitutional. That happens in 1962. Um, Justice William Douglas, who was part of uh, the majority, struck down the voting scheme. And what did they use to do that? The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Again, the very heart of all civil rights legislation in the United States. And the court said this. 
actually Chief Douglas or Justice Douglas said, the conception of political equality can mean only one thing, one person, one vote. So after 1962, actually in the 1962 election, every person in Georgia who voted, their vote counted the same for the first time since 1917. That meant if Jay votes, how, many, how much does her vote count? One. If Marley votes, how, many, how much does her vote count? One. Everybody's vote counts the same. And I'm pretty sure that's what our founding fathers intended. But Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, that all comes to a, to a halt. All right. We're not going to get through this. We'll actually pick up with this on Monday. Um, but we'll hold an election, and you can see what happens in Georgia between 1917 and 1962. I don't know who that was. They told me, and I couldn't hear. Anyway, um, y'all have a great weekend. Go find some history. <laughs>